Welcome to our first panel on regional perspectives on democratic decline. I'm Ryan Heath, and I write Politico's Global Translations newsletter. We've also got a podcast. They're free, so please do sign up. Back to the topic. On every continent, consolidated democracies have begun to see their democratic institutions weaken. We see pandemic power grabs, populist appeals, judicial politicization, and attacks on independent media and civil society. You know, a lot of people think that I'm part of a fake news blob rather than a flawed real person. And in the midst of all of this decline, millions of citizens are rising up and demanding better governance from Hong Kong to Belarus. So over the next 45 minutes, this panel of experts will discuss trends and challenges on every continent. And we promise we'll throw in some hope as well. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We've got Milada Bahudova, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of North Carolina. We've also got Milan Vashnav. He's Director and Senior Fellow of the South Asia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We have Andres Velasco. He's the Dean of the Public Policy School at the London School of Economics and a former Finance Minister of Chile. And finally, last but not least, Emmanuel Jima Bodhi. He's the co-founder of Afrobarometer and the founder of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. Yep. Thanks, Thank Ryan. You. Milada, uh, I'd love to turn to you first. Uh, I've got a lot of experience living and working in the European Union, uh, and I look across a lot of EU actions recently, and I just alternate between hope and despair. It feels like the EU, on one hand, has learned a lot from the last crisis and recession, it's also stopped bleeding the distrust in the EU that was building for years. And we know the EU is this safety net for democracy. But also I see Merkel, Macron, often putting business ahead or alongside their values when it comes to China or Russia. The EU's got a vaccine export restrictions rather than helping neighbors. So countries like Serbia turn to Russia and China to have their great vaccine success. What do you see amongst all of these contradictory trends? Oh, thank you, Ryan, and it's a pleasure to be here. You know, the European Union, as I studied it in my work over the last three decades, used to have a really phenomenal democracy promotion engine, and that was the enlargement process. And it came off sort of the disaster of the Balkan Wars and, and the Bosnian War in particular, where its foreign policy was so damaging, to, you know, kind of believing in the European Union and EU enlargement as a motor for promoting democracy and well being. And unfortunately, with a lot of challenges, that has fallen away. And at the same time, we see the rise of authoritarian regimes within the EU. Uh, with uh, Professor Sophie Munye at, at Princeton, where we show how the EU's power on the world stage really concentrates in trade. It used to concentrate in enlargement, and it's always had trouble agreeing on foreign policy. And now with this heterogeneity within the EU and having, for example, Hungary as an authoritarian regime, my worry is that slowly the European Union, especially this is what Orban wants, uh, the leader of Hungary, is being decoupled from the regime type of liberal democracy. And I think Merkel and Macron because of all these competing challenges and interests, energy and um, trade, they need to stand up for that liberal democracy as the foundation of the European Union, and they're not doing it. Absolutely. Um, now, Milan, if I can bring you in, we're going to jump from the EU to India, but I promise we'll ask some general questions that everyone gets to, to answer in the second round. Uh, we've seen a number of controversial moves by the Modi government, which in theory runs the world's biggest democracy, uh, from the citizenship law to the handling of the pharma protests. I get a lot of angry emails from readers telling me that I must refer to India as a flawed democracy now. Um, and yet Modi, he enjoys the highest approval ratings of any democratic leader I can think of, you know, often in the high 70s and the 80s. Uh, what are we to make of that? Uh, thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great and, 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 and puzzling question indeed. Uh, I certainly agree with your premise that there is concern from diverse quarters about the state and health of democracy in India. You know, George Soros at last year's 
World Economic Forum singled out India as the number one threat to democracy around the world. If you look at Freedom House, which of course rates democracies uh, around the globe, uh, India saw the single biggest decline in its democracy rating, I think of any of the 25 largest democracies in the world. Uh, just this morning, I'm sitting here in Washington, I opened up uh, my copy of the Washington Post and the lead editorial is about democratic backsliding in India uh, and the recent arrests of a young uh, college uh, activist, environmental advocate um, on uh, charges of sedition Mm -hmm. And the editorial states that uh, India doesn't deserve to call itself a democracy if it engages in this kind of activity. So there are really three central concerns I think people have. The first is this resurgence we're seeing of kind of Hindu majoritarianism, which is very much embodied in the prime minister, uh, as well as the ideology of his party and his social base. Uh, the second is a sort of closing space for civil society, uh, an intolerance for dissent, a resort to calling people who disagree with Modi's policies as anti-nationals uh, using kind of dehumanizing rhetoric. And then I think the third is this sort of excessive concentration of executive power in the hands of kind of, you know, uh, one leader who kind of uh, is, is trying to run a very diverse country uh, very centrally uh, through the prime minister's office. Now, uh, the question was about, you know, how is Modi popular? Well, I think, frankly, there are a lot of Indians who believe that, you know, India has long been a large country, but not a particularly important one. And one of the things that Modi has been able to do has really put India on the map, right? He, he speaks about a much more muscular vision for the country at home in terms of dealing with kind of anti-government forces as well as abroad and how it might throw its weight around. Uh, and I think frankly, he is a product of disenchantment with a lot of the traditional political establishment uh, represented uh, by the Congress party. Sort of, you know, he is someone who's seen as operating in the national interest, who is incorruptible, uh, who is the tough leader waiting to take the tough call. And so I think in some, uh, voters have really given him a very long leash to say, you know, we may not agree with any one individual decision, but Modi is trying to remake uh, 65 years of Indian history and he can't do it in five years. So therefore, rather than kind of picking on any one flaw, he needs to be given the time and the space. And, and by time and space, I mean 10 or 15 years really to implement uh, his vision. And so as a result, if you look at any global ranking of popularity of heads of state, Modi is heads and shoulders above everyone else. I see some real echoes of Viktor Orban and the way he's been able to elevate Hungary's uh, visibility, if not its reputation there, and, and, and Modi positioning similar to how Trump seemed to be positioning towards the, the end of his uh, term. Uh, if we turn to you now, Andres, uh, we've just heard, or the audience has just heard, uh, Madeleine Albright make the point that people want to both eat and vote, that democracy can't just be about what happens at a ballot box if, if there is no economic justice and, and functioning economic system. I thought I might ask you, what is the role of a finance minister? What is the role separately of central bankers to providing a stable floor for democracy, promoting growth and jobs, showing that the institutions of democracies still do work even when there is a crisis, be it a, a recession or a pandemic? Or I think what the great model in Albright is saying is that uh, democracies don't simply have to exist. They also have to deliver. And of course, economic well-being is one of the main things that they have to deliver on. And here, of course, democracies, not just in the emerging market world, but in, you know, in the EU and North America have a pretty spotty record. <clears throat> they allowed a massive financial crisis to erupt 10 years ago with consequences that we're still uh, enduring and paying for. So I think the big connection, or if, if you want to put it this way, the big vulnerability in the link between economic policymaking on the one hand and, and democracy on the other hand is legitimacy. Uh, you know, I live in the United Kingdom and in the course of the Brexit discussions, what you heard a Tory minister say was that the UK has had enough of experts. We don't want experts. We don't want economists. Uh, 
and of course, in the course uh, of, of, of the current debates over what to do uh, about the pandemic, many governments and many leaders and many activists have echoed that cry around the world. But of course, in the end, this is bad for democracy because a democracy that has run well, uh, of course, gives the ultimate control to the voters, to the people, but we need expert know-how. If my tooth aches, I could go to a bar with friends, uh, make it go away, the toothache that is, for, for an evening, but the next morning, I will still have to go to the dentist. If we have problems in the management of our economists, at some point, we have to talk to the experts, and the experts tend to be in central banks and finance ministries. Uh, but here, I think, um, because of repeated failures, because of worsening income, income distribution in some countries, not in all, because of our great difficulties in preventing these massive crises, uh, the political legitimacy, the credibility of a lot of economic policymakers, central banks, um, and not just locally, also internationally, the World Bank, the IMF, etc., is very much in question. Um, and there are only two ways out of this. First is better performance, uh, more uh, audacity in thinking, and I see, I, you know, we're seeing a fair bit of this in response to the pandemic. And the other one is, of course, you know, the old recipe of improving transparency, accountability, and all those things that you know ensures, or at least helps ensure that uh, ultimately all these institutions have to report to the boss and the boss of course is the voter. Excellent. And now Emmanuel, sorry we took a while to get to you. Uh, right. Your organization does great work and I know that Afrobarometer has surveyed 16 African populations on their views on democracy for years now and it seems that there are still very strong majorities for key elements of electoral democracy but there's a big gap between the democracy that people say they want and what they think they're getting. Uh, can you tell us what are the trends in Africa that we should be most concerned about? And maybe also tell us a little bit about whether the African Union is being effective in those discussions. Okay, thanks, Ryan. But just a quick correction. The Afrobarometer, in fact, has been doing a survey of over 30 countries in several rounds. Uh, since 1999, so we have more than 16. Um, but because we didn't start the surveys uh, each round in all the countries, okay. we do, you know, when it comes to over time comparisons, uh, there are only fewer countries right now. We can do maybe 20 or 22 over time comparisons for 36 countries. But anyway, it's a great question that you are asking. Uh, first, but I think it's important for us to go a little bit back and remember that until about seven years ago, Africa appears to be on a steady course of progress towards democracy and accountable governance. Um, with the ballot box uh, replacing uh, coups with uh, media and civil society flourishing and so on. Now, our we should have that there. And I would accept that in recent years, certainly in the last five years, last seven years, uh, the trend has been it setbacks, still made in the best of places um, and stagnation. And so that then generates the great, great, great um, dynamic in African politics. Now, in terms of the African Union and other and African sub-regional bodies, as well as, and I must add, the European Union, uh, the United States, E7 countries, and so on, there the story is very negative because it's important, you know, as much as we like to say, and I and it is the case that the impetus for African democratization projects of the 90s was certainly homegrown, but they benefited exceedingly from an auspicious global and African regional setting. Their misfortune, the unfortunate development in Africa today is that uh, first you've got the great retreat of the West and E7 countries, European Union and the US a big retreat from its commitments to 
democratic governance, liberal democracy, and so on, and replacement by more transnational neo Cold War uh, approaches to international diplomacy, and especially in its relationship with Africa these days. For the African Union, it's also meant a retreat from the kinds of commitments that led the African Union to come up with the uh, African peer review mechanism, where Africans were going to promote uh, governance and democracy through their own, through peer review, through peer pressure. And increasingly, they backed away from that. And I think not the least of all is that Africa today does not have the same kinds of leaders it used to have in the 2000s who were strongly committed to democratic governance. You know, the Obasan Joes and the John Kufuors and the Tabon Bekis and others that have moved on um, and they have not been, we don't have any in the current generation of African uh, incumbent leaders who have anything near that kind of commitment to democratic governance and that really has impoverished the process of democratization and governance reforms in Africa. Thank you, Emmanuel. That is a very good jumping off point to my first question that I address to all of you, uh, and it's around pandemic power grabs. We've seen them all over the place in the last 12 months, from Hungary to Philippines, Tanzania, El Salvador, Bolivia. I'm sure there's many more as well. Um, I wanted to get uh, a sense from you, given that the conditions that enable those power grabs, the frustrations uh, that act as a cover for them, uh, they're not really going away anytime soon. So I wanted to get your thoughts on where we need to be worried about next. Where are you watching in 2021 uh, for further erosion of democracy? Um, feel free to jump in, anyone. Um, and if no one wants to jump in, then uh, I turn to Malada, since she's been waiting the longest. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so, you know, we both are mentioned Orban in Hungary and it, it, you know, it's difficult to see the power of Orban decreasing in the near term, although there's some chance that, some slim chance that he could lose the election. Um, but what's dangerous about Orban right now is that he's really serving as a leader and an example for other uh, sort of strong men in European countries. And you're absolutely right to use a very similar playbook. So the way that Modi concentrates power in India has a lot of echoes with how Orban has concentrated power in Hungary. And now the country that we're all really watching is Poland because Poland has a ethno-populist government. And I do want to stress that in Europe, the problem isn't populist governments as such. And it frustrates me when in, in the media, uh, populism is often associated with democratic backsliding as if the two automatically go together. You know, not all populists are aspiring, aspiring authoritarians. And in Europe, we have left populist parties that don't have like an ethnic definition of the <laughs> deserving people. And they've actually become kind of ordinary democratic governing parties such as Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain. It's really these ethno-populist parties uh, that use the defense of the people to legitimize concentrate power. Because if you argue, right, that the opposition parties are the enemy's people, then that gives you an enormous sort of scope to concentrate power. And we see from opinion polls, even citizens in, also in the United States who claim to defend, to support democracy will then make that exception if they think the opposition is so dangerous and so damaging. So Poland, I think is really the country where, right, we still have some free press. We have a lot of protest in the streets. The opposition controls the Senate, but we have a, a a ruling party that is using every kind of trick in the power concentration playbook, including incredibly vicious vilification of the LGBT community and other minorities. So I feel that Poland hangs in the balance and this might be where the European Union can really make a difference one way or the other. I might bring you in Andres, just to mix it up. Um, yeah. Are you seeing any warning signs in South or Latin America? Plenty of them, but before I go into that, let me just maybe 
expressed a slightly dissenting voice uh, from what Malada just said. It is true that not every populist is a future dictator, but the seeds of authoritarian rule are very often present in the populistic approach to politics. Because if you start from the point of view that your position is the only legitimate one, and everybody else is acting uh, on the interest of some evil force, if it's right-wing populism, of course, it's an ethnic minority or your next door neighbors. If it's left-wing populist, it's the elites. But um, you immediately divide the world into the good and the bad guys, the legitimate and the illegitimate forces. And it's a very short step from that position to the natural conclusion, which is so and so and so and so. These guys are not legitimate actors. We're going to take the rights away. We're going to close their newspapers and we're going to push them to the sides of politics. Uh, you know, Eastern Europe, India are moving along this line. I come from Latin America. We invented this a century ago. We have a PhD in authoritarian populists. And, uh, you know, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, in the last century, people like Perón in Argentina, Vargas in Brazil, kind of wrote the playbook that uh, the Donald Trumps and the Modis of the world have been reading recently. And regrettably, Latin America, which seemed to be getting away from that, is backsliding. Where do I see dangers? Of course, the tragedy is Venezuela, which, um, you know, if anybody could argue that Venezuela is not a dictatorship, that argument is absolute rubbish nowadays. Venezuela has gone all the way to a complete abolition of democratic freedoms and checks and balances. As you pointed out, a couple of countries in Central America, uh, El Salvador is one, Nicaragua is another, are on their way there. Not quite all the way, but moving in the wrong direction. And in South America, there are two trends uh, that I worry about. One is uh, the return to power of populists who in the past played fast and loose with the rules of democracy. Of course, they themselves cannot run, but their close associates have just won election. I'm thinking of Bolivia, where associates of uh, Evo Morales are returning to power, and uh, Ecuador, where, where it's quite likely that in the second round, uh, a close associate of former President Correa might return to power. Evo Morales and Correa are not outright anti-democratic forces. They did govern after having won elections, but there's a very long list of corners they cut, a very long list of in, you know, democratic institutions they weakened, uh, changes in the constitution that are very questionable, attempts at running again and again and again and staying in power forever. So there's at least uh, you know, good reason to be vigilant. Last but not least, uh, if you think of very large countries like Mexico and, 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 and Brazil, we also have seen, in one case, you know, a populist of the right, Bolsonaro in Brazil, in another case, a populist of the left, AMLO in Mexico. We have seen um, preliminary, but nonetheless worrying indications that they are perfectly willing to curtail, say, the autonomy of uh, you know, the statistical agency uh, to, you know, to begin down that very slippery slope that uh, can lead uh, to the weakening of democracy. Preliminary steps, but worrying steps nonetheless. That is a very important point I'm going to circle back to about when we have to activate concern, uh, how early in the process. Um, but I wanna give uh, Milan and, and Emmanuel a chance to, to chip in on that previous question, if you would like. Yes, I do. Please. I do. And that I do, I do agree with you that, you know, COVID-19 um, has provided at least opportunity for autocratic African leaders to want to claw back and um, to do things their own way. But I think um, that even before that, and even without COVID, for Africa, it's, there's also the problem of poor quality economic growth, and especially the, the kind of economic growth that has not been able to generate jobs and the kind of uh, growth that has not produced, that also uh, sits comfortably with widening inequality and inequities in the distribution of uh, economic, economic benefits. Then also, it's the big problem of elite, elite capture of democracy itself.
as we are seeing uh, from as it's coming out of the state capture commission in South Africa about how the Zuma government and cronies and friends systematically basically raided the state for its own benefit and left so many people out. I think a bigger problem and related to all of this, that's especially related to democracy capture, is the problem of elite impu of political elite impunity and corruption and sowing the seeds, at least in Africa, at, in the Horn of Africa and in West Africa for growing insurgency and those kinds of developments that then trigger authoritarian responses. Thank you. Um, Milan, anything from you? I know Melada wants to jump in quickly as well. Uh, just a quick thing. I think when, when I think about what's happening in India and in, uh, specifically, it's not so much the COVID-19 pandemic that I think is shaping a quote unquote power grab. It's really India's perception of the fragmentation of power in the global system, right? Uh, and the feeling that um, India really can throw its weight around now uh, with, uh, with, with fewer sort of constraints, right? We have moved from a kind of unipolar moment to a much more fragmented multipolar system in which India is seen to be a vital player, a vital player with respect to the United States strategic ambitions vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, a vital player insofar as that it is one of the two key markets of, uh, of the future. Uh, and so therefore, this, um, closing space for civil society, new restrictions that in fact have been announced today on digital media, social media companies, um, uh, kind of economic sort of nationalism, right? Part of the bet that's being placed in the corridors of power in New Delhi is look, you guys need us more at this particular juncture than we need you. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, that is uh, really quite a powerful signal. Thanks. Um, Milada, do you want to jump in? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to, to agree and disagree with Andres. So I, I agree that this good versus bad division that populists introduce has the seeds of uh, a kind of authoritarian rule in it. Um, but we do have global data, right? That kind of shows that populism as such, if the populists, especially if they stay out of power, can also be associated with greater participation and, and in some cases, greater representation for minorities, the ones that are on the left and take this kind of ex inclusionary view of the people. But the empirical record in Europe is simply that it is the ethno-populist or wet-wing populist parties that have engaged in the concentration of power. And I would throw in the British Conservative Party in the UK, right? You take a existing conservative party and you sort of remodel it using ethno-populism. This has happened in Poland, this has happened in Hungary, this has happened in the United States as well as in the UK. What I find so worrying about <clears throat> ethno-populism is that it's not the neighbor next door. Andres, it's actually, that was the old far right. It was all about conflict with the neighbor next door. And these ethnopopulists are all on the same page, that the enemy is this cosmic experts, as you mentioned, also Islam, uh, so refugees, but also sort of the religion of Islam uh, and George Soros and the transnational elites who want to take things away from the good people. Uh, and that's the disturbing part because that means these ethno-populist parties are all together as opposed to fighting one another, which is what they used to do. That is really the perfect um, bridge into the next question where I wanted to connect the local and the global. So obviously uh, people have more influence in their own communities than outsiders ever will. Um, at the same time, if I learned anything from dealing with the Hungarian government while I worked at the EU from 2010 to 2014, it's that you can't let these things slip out of control. You really need to raise a red flag at the beginning. So I want to bring in a question from Emily Marie Williams, uh, who's one of our Colorado audience members. And she's asking, what role does community building play in fighting authoritarianism? And then I want to connect it to this idea of when should outsiders step in? And, and is it ever useful to do that? 
Um, maybe I, I'll, I'll come back to you, Emmanuel. Great, and I, I think the, the, the good starting point for, for, for my response is that, you know, fortunately in Africa at least, the challenge of democracy is a supply side problem. It's a far, it's a completely different story when it comes to popular demand, popular wishes, popular aspirations. The Afrobarometer data and anecdotal data show over and over again that the demand is very strong. The aspiration is very strong. It's that the problem is that supply has been weak and has been lagging. That then uh, posits a very interesting challenge. Knowing that there are grassroots groups and communities in these countries that are supportive of democracy and democratic governance, knowing that there's a whole band of courageous young people who are willing to go and face the bullets faced by security agencies, knowing that there are some committed cartoonists who are keen to lampoon bad governance, lampoon autocrats and so on, take a great deal of risk. The question is, what can we do to help them and to support them and to protect them. And I think that then is a challenge for the international community. And if I could ask you a follow-up, Emmanuel, slightly uh, on a tangent, but we've got a question from Olivia Cousteau, who's a student at the Corbell School hosting us here. Um, she wanted to know what you thought about China's growing investment in Africa and if that is going to affect Africa's future democratization. Well, in fact, it is part of the problem. Part of the problem, the challenge of democracy in Africa today is the emergence of powers like China. Um, in our context, India, um, Turkey, and others that simply are democracy neutral or democracy adverse, and therefore have provided our autocrats with alternative sources of support, uh, financial support, security support, and moral support. That is a real problem for Africa today. Thank you. Um, Milan, what's getting back to that balance between grassroots protection and promotion of democracy and, and outside action? Um, where do you think the balance lies? Well, you know, frankly, in a country uh, as, as, as large as India, which has historically now for seven decades been in, in, uh, exceptionally sensitive to the uh, outside pressure and quote unquote foreign meddling, I think that domestic community building um, is really key. And, and, and frankly, we have seen examples of success. Um, for instance, in 2019, uh, Parliament passed a very controversial citizenship amendment law, which creates a fast track pathway to citizenship for a range of minorities, save for one community, uh, Muslims. Now, uh, the law did go through. However, the, the government has not actually uh, rolled out the rules that would implement the law. And in part because there was a local pushback from many communities uh, uh, who are against this law. Uh, more recently, we see the case of the farmer protests. Now, I think there is a consensus among economists that the new farm bills that the Modi government has passed um, that would liberalize agriculture are probably a good thing in the medium to long term. But they were passed in such a way, well, which they were really rammed through with very little democratic consent, not even a recorded vote on the floor of parliament. Uh, and we've seen tens of thousands of farmer protests. The government has now offered to stay those laws for up to 18 months. The farmers haven't uh, taken that. They, they want a, a full-scale repeal. So we don't know how the story is going to end. But you know that has been very uh, effective, I think, for the United States. Uh, you know, my, my colleague Ashley Tellis says that during the Trump administration, uh, India and countries like India enjoyed a values holiday, right? <laughs> uh, suffice it to say, democracy and human rights were not at the forefront of the Trump foreign policy agenda. That is likely to change uh, and is already changing. We see evidence of that in a Biden administration. 
However, I think it is going to be subtle. I think it is going to be uh, privately rather than publicly communicated. So I do think that plays a role, but I think it is a very secondary role in a country like India to domestic uh, pressure from the bottom up. <laughs> Andres, what about you? I think the big job here is clearly domestic. I would extend it beyond community building to the strengthening of democratic institutions and the bringing of democracy closer to the average voter. I think in many countries, uh, this is certainly true of Latin America, but I can, you know, you could probably say the same thing about the US or about countries in Europe. Most people that the political feel that the political world is out there, the politicians appear every four years when they run for office. And there, there's a yawning gap between the concerns of average voters and the concerns of politicians. This is also related to the decline of political parties. Once upon a time in the US, you know, if you're a working class Democrat in Chicago, you know, much of your personal and family identity gyrated around that. So you had strong links with a political identity. Today in much of Europe and North America, Latin America, political parties, you know, have really gone down in popularity. Nobody thinks of them very much. And therefore they don't play that mediating role that was so key that brought democracy close to people. It also allowed democracy to make better decisions when you could get unified blocks voting in Congress as opposed to every member of Congress on his or her own. When is it right for the outside uh, to meddle? Well, it depends who the outside is. You know, if the outside is Donald Trump, Latin Americans spent a lot of time sending messages, please don't meddle because whatever you touch is likely to go on the wrong way. If the outside is uh, the European Union with uh, unquestioned and unquestionable democratic legitimacy, I think the answer is yes, it ought to meddle and then it ought to meddle vigorously. And my personal view is that the, Democrat, the, the, the EU has been timid when dealing with the Orbans of the world, that has been timid with dealing with whatever is going on in Poland. Uh, you know, an institution like the EU has a lot of scope for being more vigorous. Last but not least, a footnote on populism in Europe, uh, I am not altogether sure that left-wing populism in Europe is so extraordinarily good for democracy. If we um, had some Spaniards on the panel, they would probably point out that the support by Podemos of uh, the kind of inconstitutional and often, often violent separatism in, in Catalonia is not exactly a, fo a force for good in democracy. But uh, I'm sure we have more than one view on that subject. Now, we went 41 minutes without getting into Trump, so that was a pretty good uh, effort from all of us. Um, but just now that we've got three minutes left, um, I wanted to bring in a couple of questions that will touch on, on Trump. And basically, uh, it's combining two questions, one from Aaron Fels and another one from a student here at the Corbell School. And the question is, is democratic decline overstated? And the follow-up is, how does your answer um, there um, compared to democratic backsliding in the US? Basically, how do you rate democratic backsliding in the US in relation to everything else you see in the world? Uh, so 45 seconds each, and I'll, I'll go back to the original order. Malada, you're first. Thank you. So I don't think democratic backsliding is overdrawn. And I think looking at, uh, going back to the community question, looking at protest, looking at where people are rising up against the concentration of power is I think a very good indicator of where democratic sliding uh, is going on. The protests by women in Poland, in the Czech Republic, we've had enormous protests that some of them are really about like a seminar in liberal democracy and the value of counter majoritarian institutions. Um, and I think, you know, going back to the COVID question, I'm really hoping that because on the one hand with reduced immigration, but on the other hand with more attention to sort of human well being, we may shift the substance of political competition back to more about economic issues about how the state governs the economy. This is what we need in the United States as well, right? We're trying to shift from the Trump era of ethnic scapegoating to an era where we try to solve problems of education, health, and infrastructure. The final thing is that it's very important to separate the impact of neoliberal economic policies 
which had to rising inequality from liberal democracy. So often trick that they make these yeah. I'm going to have to jump in there, Malata. Yeah, uh, we've now got 30 seconds left for the others. Milan, go. Yeah, I'll be really quick. I think on the question of is democratic backsliding real, it is. Freedom House shows that in the past 14 years, the number of countries whose democracy rating has declined uh, versus increased uh, has been much larger for the declines. I, I think it's true that uh, electoral procedures and, and quote unquote free and fair elections are doing okay, but it's really the substance of democracy between elections. Uh, that's really suffered. Or on the US question, I think that it is the number one exemplar of democratic backsliding. In fact, I find it hard sitting in Washington to pay attention to developments in India because the crisis at home is so serious. And I think this has obviously domestic repercussions for those of us who are Americans, but also uh, the power of our example is uh, utterly uh, demolished uh, when we talk about democracy uh, overseas. And I think that that's a pretty big price to pay. Thank you. Andras, lightning answer. Oh, we should worry about this uh, a lot because as Milan pointed out, the data is absolutely overwhelming. There's democratic back backsliding of all kinds in all kinds of places. Uh, on the US, uh, surely a major example of the danger, but I will say that as I watched those low level officials in counties one had never heard of, coming out and doing the unpopular thing and saying, contrary to what the president said, the election was clean and the president seems to have lost. Uh, I was impressed, you know, I think my heart went out to them. That was a source of democratic strength. That was an example of democratic strength. Uh, so on the whole, it is people like that that lead me to be fairly optimistic about the course of democracy in the US in spite of all the bad stuff we've seen recently. Couldn't agree more. And Emmanuel, final thought from you. Well, first, for the ordinary African across, across, across the continent, there is really no such thing as democratic backsliding in, in the sense that their preference, their wish, their aspiration for democracy and accountable governance remains strong. For reluctant democratic leaders, for autocrats for fascist inclined type of African leaders. Trump was a blessing and the, and the decline in democratic standards in the West is a blessing to them because they've got easy excuses. I wish we could keep talking, but there's gonna be no power grabs at this summit. We're gonna to stick to schedule. So thank you to all of our panelists and next up, a quick round of live cartooning. Thank <laughs> you.